couple of weeks since I have, um, since I started this series, and um, I'm not going to go back and recap, but we're, we're talking about things that you really need to know about God. What are the things that you really need to know about God? Um, and of course, there's many things that we really need to know about God, right? And we can go and we can list them because God is, is endless. God is um, unfathomable. We cannot know everything about God, but we can know some important things that matter in our relationship with God, that help us navigate our life here on earth, that help us win every day over the usual battles that we find ourselves with. And the one thing that we want to talk about today is the trustworthiness of God. The trustworthiness of God. Now, now if, I, if, I had, um, if I hadn't set it out and planned it out and put all the, the, the parts of this series out before with all the spaces, I probably would have thought today, well, this would be the right one to choose. But I set this out long before the events that have recently happened in my life and the life of my family happened. This was the plan for the day. So it reaches and it speaks to us directly. It speaks to me, in fact, that God is trustworthy. You can trust Him. Some would say, you can take it to the bank. But there's something better than taking it to the bank, right? There is trusting God. The question that I have for you today is what keeps you up at night? When you wake up in the middle of the night and, um, and you maybe wake up in a cold sweat or you wake up with something on your mind and it niggles and it won't let go, what is that thing? What keeps you up? What keeps your mind busy? What keeps you thinking? And over and over and over going over something. You know, it only takes a, a scroll through your news app. It only takes a turn on the TV and you see all that's going on. The war, the political unrest, the economic uncertainty, gas prices, right? Oh, you guys don't put a gas in your cars, right? Um, the next doctor's appointment, all these things that... that um, it go in your mind, will your kids be safe? The bills, the debt, things that you have to keep in check and keep working with. And if I keep going on like this, if you didn't have anything to worry about, I'd soon give you something to mind you to worry about it. And that's not my point, but the things that are there, what is it that you are worried about? You know, um, there's many things, but for me, one thing that seems to, to, to get me really unglued sometimes is all the unfinished projects that I have. I don't know why they're all unfinished, but I have a lot of things I started and haven't finished. And they really bother me. So I try to do one at a time and get them done, but you know what? It doesn't always go smoothly in the way that I needed to because who knows that things break in between and create another project before you can finish the last one. So some of those things get me all worried sometimes. How do I get everything done? And in trying to do it all, what do I leave undone? Who gets left disappointed? Who gets left out? Who doesn't get what they need. See, the, to ask ourselves, what is it that you worried about is really important. Really important. If you're taking notes this morning, write down on your paper right in front of you the thing that you worry most about. What is the thing that you think most often and have a concern about in your life? If you don't have paper and pen, just, just sort of inscribe it in your brain and mark it. Say it to yourself that this is the thing. 
And there's a reason I'm asking this. There's a reason for this exercise because it's really important. As I prepared for this message, I really got to this point and I had to stop, I had to cry out to God. See, the reason I ask this is the thing that we worry most often about reveals where we trust God the least. That, in my consideration, just shook me to the core. Say, God, is it, is it true that I, that I trust you so little in these areas in my life? But Jesus reminds us and helps us in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6 is a great chapter. Well, can I say there isn't a great chapter in the Bible? But this chapter, Jesus is speaking and he unpacks so much in this chapter. You can spend a year on it and not get through it all. But it says, therefore I tell you, now if Jesus is speaking to us, I think we can pay attention, right? Perhaps we could pay more attention when Jesus is speaking than when Paul is or when James is. I don't think so really, but, but in our minds when Jesus is speaking, this, gotta, this has got to be important stuff. He says, do not worry about your life. I don't know if he said it quite like that. Perhaps Jesus is not, wasn't as excited as I am, and he said, do not worry about your life. Either way, he meant it, that we should not worry. He said, don't worry. Well, that leaves me in a problem, leaves me in a place, leaves me in a pickle, because sometimes I worry. Right? Anyone else worry sometimes? At least once a day? Yeah. Don't worry. Then in verse 27, he says, Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And the answer is no. Worrying doesn't add anything. But we worry anyway. We worry. Anyway, Cory Ten Boom, who spent time in a concentration camp as a child, she famously is known for this quote, worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow, but it empties today of its strength. And she's right. See, worry doesn't Worry saps the energy out of us. But God, you know, when God created Adam, we know that God gave him one rule. Adam, you can eat anything in all of the garden. It's all yours. Enjoy. But there's one tree. Leave that one alone. My paraphrase, right? Eat all, everything, every, any tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge, good and evil. And Eve learns this lesson from Adam. But one day Eve is finding herself in the garden. Adam's not too far away, by the way, but Eve is, um, finds herself in the garden and there's the serpent, there's Satan, shows up and begins to have a conversation with Eve. I'm, I think that should have been the first sign of like something is wrong, right? But anyway, um, has this conversation and the serpent begins with these words, did God really say? Did God really say? You couldn't eat from any tree. Just twisting the truth, sure, throwing some doubt in there, introducing a question to Eve. Did God really say, what is he doing? What is the serpent doing? He's asking Eve in a different way, can you really trust God? Is God trustworthy? You see, in some verses later, Eve looks at the tree and it says there, she says, she looked at the tree, First thing she did was looked at it. It's like Satan made her look, right? 
Ever play made you look? Well, that's what happened. He made a look. I don't know if she never paid attention before, but this time she looked. And from that looking, things began to spiral down. And there are some stages of temptation that took place. This is another study, another thing, but you can look at them. You can write them down. You can dig it out yourself. She looked at the tree and she saw that it was good to eat. That it was pleasing to the eye. And it was desirable for gaining wisdom. All things, a progression of temptation there. See, every day we make roundabout, they tell us. I, I've never counted them. Honestly, I think that would be, that keep me too busy. But they say we do make about 35,000 decisions every day. Imagine that. Just going through a day can be, can be tiring. It helps me when somebody comes and says, you need to make a decision on this now. It's like, oh, that's fine. That's one of my 35,000 today. No problem. No problem whatsoever. Load it in, right? No, it doesn't always feel that way. But if you're already making 35,000 a day, make them good decisions. But she had to make a decision. One of her 35,000 a day will she trusts God. The question to us is, will I, am I going to trust in what I see? What I see, is that, going to, is that going to get my attention? Will I trust God or am I going to trust in what I can touch? Will I trust God or, I'm going to, or am I going to trust in what I want, what I crave, what I desire? Will I trust God or I'm going to trust what I can control. Every single one of us has to answer this question, is God trustworthy? Look at Psalm chapter 68, verse 7 and 8. Psalm 68, 62, sorry, 62, verse 7 and 8. Psalm 62, 7 and 8. Now, the psalmist here is talking about God's trustworthiness. He's, 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 he's helping us out with our question today. Is God trustworthy? And he comes and he says here, My salvation and my honor depend on God. They depend on God. Not on you, not on me. Not on... Um, Myself, my own ability. See, one of, one of life's important lessons, and it takes us all a different length of time to learn. And if you are young, learn this lesson early. Don't wait until you're old. Don't wait until you another day. Learn this lesson early because it will help you along the way. But one thing is that one of life's lessons is that we must acknowledge our dependence on God. We have to acknowledge that. We have to come to the place and say, God, I depend on you for my life, for my existence. You are my God. You are my life. You are all that matters to me. God, I surrender my will. I surrender my emotions. I surrender my heart to you. When we come and say, Lord, I, I gave my heart to the Lord one day. What we are saying is, God, that everything that I desire, I have surrendered to you. Oh boy, but, but when we make that decision, there sometimes is the process of surrender that still needs to take place. And some of us stubborn people take a little longer to surrender than others. Some of us who, who have a chip of pride on their shoulder take a little longer to acknowledge our dependence on God. But either way, the shorter trip that we make that, the better we are to live our lives before God. But he goes on, he says, My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my rock. Is He your rock? Your solid place. He is my rock and my refuge. 
Right? When God's your rock and refuge, there's no worry there, right? In verse 8, he says, trust Him at all times. Wow. Even when I'm worried, then I trust Him and the worry is supposed to go away. Not some of the time, not when I feel like it, not, not just with your eternity. Some people trust God only with their eternity, right? Gave my heart to the Lord. I belong to Him. I surrendered. I do a little every Sunday maintenance on this. But, you know, don't, don't expect me to bring God into other areas of my life. Let's not be that way. Let's trust God with more than just our ticket to heaven, so to speak. So, not just some things, but I trust Him at all times, in all matters. You people, he goes on, you people. Now, I know sometimes that sounds like, who's calling me you people, right? Today that's become a bit of an insult, right? Right? You people, pour out your hearts to Him. Pour out your worries, your fears. Pour them out to Him. Why? Why should we do this? He goes on and says, For God is our refuge. God is our refuge. He understands that God is trustworthy. God is our refuge. God is deserving of our confidence. God is deserving of our confidence. Put our confidence in Him. Yeah, we use the word deserving a lot in our world today and many people get things that they don't deserve and then they're told they deserve them. But God has earned the right to be trusted. God has earned the right for us to put our confidence in Him. And we know this. I want to look at some reasons, quick three reasons, hopefully it'll be quick. Three reasons why we can know that God is trustworthy. The first one is that we, God showed Himself to be reliably reliable. Right? Right? God showed Himself to be reliably reliable. God has been faithful before. God has been faithful before. His track record speaks for Himself. God's track record is great. There has been, throughout the whole Old Testament especially, there's this theme, there's this action, there's this statement that, that occurs over and over again when, when God is spoken of to the people of, of Israel, when God is spoken of to the people, that this theme comes up over and over again, and that is remember. Remember. In Exodus 13.3, Moses said to the people, and they're just about to be delivered um, from being enslaved in Egypt. This is happening. They're coming out of Egypt and, and things are happening very quickly. Their deliverance is happening in front of them. And Moses says to them, remember this day. If only we will remember our salvation in the same way. Remember this day. Look back on this day. Do not forget this day for which you have departed from the house of slavery. For by a powerful hand, the Lord brought you out of this place. For by a powerful hand, for by the hand of God, you have been brought out of this place. Not by your own strength, not by the strength of a good leader, not by the strength of Moses, not by the strength of your own ability, not because you worked hard as slaves and you had, you had tenacity, you had strength because your backs were made strong to get out of Egypt. No! You were brought out by a mighty hand. Never forget the day of your salvation. You were brought out of sin. You were brought out of darkness. You were brought out of that horrible pit. 
by the mighty hand of God. You couldn't do it by yourself. What He has done for you, you couldn't do for yourself in a million years. Moses said to the people, remember that God has been faithful before. Remember when you cried out for mercy, God heard your cries. Remember God delivered you from the most powerful ruler in the world at that time. God delivered you through ten miraculous plagues. Remember when you got to the Red Sea, God parted the waters and you could cross over on dry land and Remember that in that same sea that parted, Pharaoh's army drowned. Remember in the wilderness when you were thirsty, God gave you water to drink. Remember that when you were hungry, God rained down manna every day to feed you. Remember. Remember what? Remember that God has been faithful before. And because He's been faithful before, we know that He will be faithful again. Another thing that Israel did a number of times, we read of this in the Bible, when something significant happened, they either built an altar or they stacked stones as a memorial. Altar was stacked stones. Sometimes they didn't put a sacrifice on it, but they stacked stones. When Jacob wrestled with the angel, and when Moses got the Ten Commandments, and when Israel crossed the Jordan River, they stacked stones, and they marked these things, and they left these stacked stones there, so that when somebody walked by, they might ask, what are these stones? And then you can tell them, this is where God delivered us from the Egyptians. This is where God brought us into the promised land. This is where God gave us the Ten Commandments. This is where God came down and wrestled with man. This is where God has brought deliverance to us. Have you built memorials in your life? Have you stacked some stones? Have you marked some places in your life where you can turn around and say, well, I know, I remember that God on such and such a time, at such and, in such and such a way, delivered me from myself, delivered me from darkness, delivered me from, from absolute near disaster. Can you remember where it happened for you? Some homework, take some time and in your, in your, in your journal, in your Bible, somewhere, make a note of the, of the stones that you have stacked in your life, of the stones of deliverance where you have built a memorial, where you have marked a point and said, God, you were there. You were there. When? Because you're going to need to have a memorial stone in your life to remind you of the faithfulness of God. And God knew that Israel needed it. And God knew it. And therefore, consistent in it is when God is introduced to to Israel by the prophets, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. And so on it goes. What is God saying? He is marking a memorial stone of how He delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And that's the story of your and my life. That we can mark the deliverance of God. The deliverance that God has brought us, that He's given to us. We has delivered us from ourselves. From our despair, from our troubles. From our mistakes from the threat of an enemy where God has delivered us. How do we know that God is trustworthy? Well, we remind ourselves that He has been faithful before. See, maybe it is truly when you were radically transformed, when you gave your heart to the Lord and He changed you and you could see a day and night difference. But for some who have have followed 
the Lord who have, who have served Him as children. You don't have that, that, that stark contrast. You kind of just breezed into it, came to a, to a decision one day that, that, that this is the right thing to do. The Holy Spirit impressed on your heart and there wasn't this thing that, that, you, were, that you were taken and you were ripped out of, of the hands of the enemy, so to speak, because you didn't see the evil and the sin that, that had attached itself to you. But yet, He has delivered you from everything that your life might have been. Every of those evil choices that you could have made because you didn't have God with you. He has delivered you ahead of time. He has released you in so many ways from suffering under the hand of evil. Doesn't mean you haven't sinned. Doesn't mean you haven't had temptation. It does mean that your salvation came earlier than most. And therefore, if you like me, we have a whole lot more to praise God for. Have a whole lot more to praise God because God has delivered us who started early from so much more. They do say prevention is greater than cure, right? See, for me most recently, and many of you know that God spared the life of my sons. See, when Satan wanted to take them, want to steal them away, want to destroy their lives, God said no. God drew a line and said no. And I am grateful to God for drawing that line. You know, when I think about their lives, two potentially fatal accidents in two years, but God said no. And God is still saying no. I don't know where you can mark something recent in your life where you have seen the faithfulness of God. I don't know how far back you have to reach to be able to mark it, but mark it anyway. Build a, a memorial of stones. Mark it down and say, God, I have seen your hand of faithfulness to me. So when the unexpected thing comes up, what do I do? Oh boy, unexpected things will come up. What do I do? Something seems to come out of left field when something seems to come out of the shadows and introduce it to myself, to, to me as, as a problem, as a threat. What do I do? I remember that God has been faithful. I remember that He is trustworthy. Firstly, we need to know and remember God is reliably reliable. Secondly, one thing that, that, that is sure that you, can, that you can hold on to in every situation, in any situation, is that God is with us today. God is with us today. He's with you today. Not, not just sometime, not just Sundays in church, not just this day, but every day God is with you. God led Israelite people out of Egypt through the wilderness. He brought them right to the edge of the promised land, right to the Jordan River. He brought them right there. And they struggled to believe that God in their thoughts was going to give them, was able to give them this land. And Joshua stands up before the people and he says this in Numbers 14 verse 9. He says, Only rebel he not, not he against the Lord, neither fear he the people of the land, for they are bred for us their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Now, if you read in that, you find out that the people wanted to stone them, wanted to kill Joshua and Caleb, said, no, these guys are delusional. They, they, they're a threat to our safety. They are crazy. Let's get rid of them. 
They do not know what they're talking about. But they did. Because they knew a God who was reliable, who was trustworthy. And so they went to His Word, to His promise, and they knew that it could be trusted. They saw the same things that the other spies saw. They saw the same things. They had the same experience. But what made the difference is they knew that they could trust in God. You see, they knew that, the, that, that their success was not dependent on what they saw in the land. Not, not on the size of the opposition. Not that their success was not dependent on... on, on their ability to go in and, and win over those armies, but their success is dependent on the presence of God in their lives. Because he says, the Lord is with us. God is with us. He promised this in Matthew. I know it's not Christmas, but Matthew 123, we tend to visit it only at Christmas time. And it says there, it says, it opens up, the New Testament opens up with this, Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us, or God with us. See, from the very beginning, when Jesus comes on the scene, he is announced to be God with us. Way back in the Old Testament, Joshua knew that. But it comes and it and God tells us in the scripture, this is the good news of Jesus, that he is with us. For every believer, Jesus is with us. He is with us. See, God, doesn't, when a difficult situation shows up in your life, God doesn't pull out and say, whoa, no, no, that's not for me. You handle this one your own, right? That's how we behave. Well, where did you go, God? What's this all about? No, the promise is that in when the difficulty shows up, that God is with you in the difficulty. That when the difficulty shows up, God doesn't disappear. He's present. He, didn't, he doesn't suddenly come into the problem either. God has always been there with you. Every single time, God is with you in the situation. God's faithfulness today does not depend on the absence of problems, but on His presence in my life. God led Israel right to the edge of their promise. He had been faithful before. He proved himself faithful before. He was with them. And did they trust him? Did they go in? No. We know the story. They did not go in. They did not trust him. See, trust is not something we have. In English terms, trust is not a noun. Trust is a verb. Trust is something we do. And we often come and we challenge the faithfulness of God. We challenge His trustworthy. When things don't go as requested or planned for or prayed for. And we come and we question, where are you God? What's going on here? But God has never left the situation. When things don't work out, God is trustworthy. We should, just be, we should be equally confident that things are going to work out when they look crazy. My term, when the wheels fall off, right? When everything seems to go wrong, we need to be equally confident when they go badly wrong or when they go perfectly right. Our trust in a trustworthy God should not waver based on what's happening in our lives. But it does. Right? You see, when, when things 
um, get peaceful and calm and there's no indication of, of, of trouble. Then we can tend not to trust on God so much. Because, well, we don't have to put our faith in God so much. There's not that much to trust Him for. There's not that much to have faith for right now. We think that we just have to have faith in times of darkness and trouble. No, faith is, is something we live by. Faith is something that, that is part of our lives every day. It's not something we turn on and off. We walk by faith. That's the biblical term for means that we live that way. We live that way. See, our security comes from God, not our circumstance. Our security doesn't come because things are going well. And so we feel secure in God. No, our security comes from God, who is in every trouble, who is in every situation. And so it doesn't depend on the circumstances. It depends on the character of God. This we need to know about God. Romans 8, 28, we know so well. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. You see, it doesn't really matter if it's easy or hard to trust God, does it? Does it matter if it's easy or hard? I think, I think we, we're nodding inside and saying, it kind of does matter, Pastor. When it's hard, it's hard. When it's easy, it's no big deal. Right? You having that conversation with yourself this morning? Yeah, it's one that I've had. It's like, well, but you see, it's not based on the circumstances. It's based on the character of God. And because God is unchanging, it doesn't depend on our circumstances. When circumstances begin to look better, it's easy to trust God a little less and a little bit more in ourselves. After all, we don't need that much more faith when things are going well. But good circumstances only give us an illusion of security. Because if, if we trusting in circumstances, then... It can change in a moment. In a moment, in a phone call, in a second, in a text, in a split second, it can all be different. Know that good circumstances do not provide security to us. What I said about prayer, the need to pray tonight, Good circumstances don't give us the security that we need. Nationally, politically, culturally, good circumstances don't give us security because it's not the circumstances that provide what we need. It is God that does. So the believer has a different route to take. The believer has a different source for their security than everyone else does. The good news is that for believers, bad circumstances are only an illusion as well of the lack of security. So when things get bad, it might look like things are insecure. It might look like trouble is, is getting the upper hand, but God hasn't changed. God hasn't gone anywhere. He is still with you. I was hoping for an amen there, but I'll just keep moving on. The end of the story is already written. Genesis 12. God calls Abraham out of the land. And he says, I want to bless you. I want you to be a blessing to the world I'm good, that I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a land where you're going to live with my people. And right there on the precipice of en entering the promised land, 
this promise hadn't changed. This promise was what they were resting on. This is the promise that they knew God had given. This is the promise that God reiterated when he brought them out of Egypt. I'll give you the land that I promised to your ancestor Abraham. In Numbers 13 verse 2, And the Lord spoke to, to Moses saying, Send thou men that they may search out the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. That's, that's the, the confidence that Caleb and Joshua had. Oh, God is giving us the land. He wasn't delusional. He wasn't out of his mind. He wasn't just having a happy day. He had the confidence in this promise. God said he would give us that land. And God said it, I believe it. In fact, we often say God said it. And I believe it, that settles. But you know what? It actually settles it if you believe it or not. It just might, your faith only causes you to participate or not. And of course they didn't enter. And, I, and, and every time I read this, I think, man, how foolish could they be? These Israelites, I, I don't get them. Ever felt that way when you, read, when you read that scripture? I don't understand the Israelites. I don't understand what, what's going on here. Why? How? Did they say no? God was faithful. God showed himself faithful to them. He was faithful to them presently. And yet they still didn't trust him. But God had written the end of the story. See, I, you and I do the same thing. As dumb as we think the Israelites are, well, I'll let you decide. I'm as dumb as them so often. I have seen God's faithfulness in the past. I know that He's faithful today. I know that He is with me. As a, as a believer, I know God has written the end of my story. He's written the end of who I am. God has made it sure and secure. Go right to the end of the Bible, Revelation 21, verse 3 and 5. And, and we see this, this marvelous scene. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among His people. He will live with them and they will be His people. God Himself will be with them and He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. You see, there will be nothing to worry about. And then in verse 5, he says, And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down. For what I tell you is trustworthy and true. God's word is trustworthy and true. God is trustworthy as a, as a believer the end of my story is already written down it's already there it's already marked it's already done and some of you might come this morning and you might be inspired you might be ready and say you know what that's awesome I, I'm, I'm getting on board I believe that yes he has been faithful in the past yes he is with me he will be faithful in the future I can trust that God is with me today. I, I'm inspired. I'm moved. I can trust God. It doesn't depend on my circumstances. It doesn't depend on anything. It depends on the trustworthiness of God. But what about the thing that I'm worrying about? Because if you're like me, you're still worrying a little bit. 
You know God is faithful. You know God is trustworthy. You know God is true. You know you can depend on Him. God has taken care of everything that your life may present. God has already taken care of it. He'll never leave you. That's what he tells us in John 14, verse 1. He says, let your hearts, but, let, but do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. But trust also in me. Trust. Can you trust in Jesus? Is he dependable? Is he trustworthy? Oh yes. Oh yes, he is. Jesus tells us, he says, I am trustworthy. I have been faithful. And I'm faithful. I'm with you today. And I will be faithful tomorrow. And the next day, and the next day, I will be there. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 also helps us with the thing that we are still worried about, even though we know about the faithfulness of God. Do not worry about anything. What? I just told you, I'm still worried after all that you said, Pastor. I'm still worried. Well, Paul writes here, says, don't worry about anything. <coughs> we take his words seriously? Yes. So what must I do? Well, do this instead. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He has done. There you go. Go look back at those memorial stones. Go look back at the faithfulness of God. Go look back where God has intervened in your life and made a difference. Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So there we go. Are we ready to trust God? To, to when we see our circumstances, when we read the newsreel, when we um, scroll through it and, and to see what's happening in our, in our land or when you speak to friends and relatives and you hear of all the troubles in their lives. Do you not be consumed with worry, with concern? Do not be overwhelmed with that because God is trustworthy. He's already in that situation but so often we don't acknowledge Him. We don't acknowledge Him. You ever come into a room and you walk in the place and nobody acknowledges you? Right? Come into a place, you've got to make an appointment and you stand at the, the appointment desk or table and there's nobody on the other side to acknowledge you. That's a weird, empty feeling. It makes me incredibly agitated. <laughs> you maybe not. But it's, there's times when, when we're in this situation where we don't acknowledge God's presence in our lives. So when the trouble comes, when the difficulty arrives, when circumstances seem to show their presence, Acknowledge God's presence because His presence overrides every circumstance. doesn't mean that bad things won't happen. It just means that God is there. And if you know He's there, you know that because He's done it before, He's been trustworthy before, He was trustworthy now. Let's bow our heads Let's acknowledge the presence of God in our lives. That thing that you wrote it down on your paper, that thing that you marked in your head, that is the thing that you have the most difficulty trusting God for. 
present it to God this morning and invite him into that. Invite him into that and say, well, God, I want to welcome you in to these troubles, into this worry. I want to welcome you in, Lord, in this thing that I have such difficulty releasing. Come in. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Come into this situation, Lord Jesus. And if there's anyone who has never come, and you say, well, I have never. I, I, this thing where, where you talk about a believer, you talk about a Christian, well, well, I have never made that commitment to the Lord. I have never made that, that choice, that decision to the Lord. Well, today is the right day to make that decision because God wants to come in and change your life. He wants to transform your life completely, take you out of darkness and bring you into His light. He wants to deliver you from every chain, every difficulty, everything that wants to destroy you. God wants to be the God who is with you. Who He wants to prove Himself faithful to you. So let Him come. The Bible says, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on His name today. Call on Him and He will save you. Let's pray. Father, we thank You. Lord, for, for all those who are contemplating so many things today. Lord, there are those who do not know You and they're hearing this message for the first time. Oh God, I want to pray for them first. Lord, would You come into their situation? Lord, I know that they find themselves in darkness. They find themselves in despair. They find themselves in trouble that will not give way. But Lord, I pray that even as they call on Your name right now, even as they say, Lord Jesus, save me, Lord, that You come by Your Spirit right into their hearts and into their lives. And Lord, from this day on, they are born again. They are a new creature in Christ. Father, I pray, Lord, would you come to them today? Lord, I pray for those who, who, have, who have lost sight of you in their troubles and in their circumstances and in their difficulties. Lord, I pray that today they would acknowledge you in that room. They would acknowledge you in their lives. They would acknowledge you in their troubles and their worries. And Lord, in that, they would be confident that you are with them, that you are there. And Lord, for them who are struggling with worry, struggling to, to release that area of worry to you, Lord, I pray that you would come and Lord, that you would give them that peace, that peace. Lord, worry is not peaceful. Worry is stressful. Worry is, is, is like warfare. It eats at our hearts and our souls. So, Father, I pray for a release and a surrender in Jesus' name. We give you thanks, Lord. Amen. And for anyone who has, has made a decision, who has called on the Lord this morning, you can certainly reach out to us if you're online. Um, put in the comments, and we'll check those comments and we'll reach out to you if you've made a decision for the Lord today. If you have called out to Him and you need prayer and you're asking for prayer, just put in the comments and we will pray with you. Lord bless you. Amen.